well models. So I think what we'll do now, the rest of today and probably half of class tomorrow, I'm going to solve your homework four for you. I'm going to live code it. Um, so I'm going to work through what I did. And this is a couple of reasons. Uh, I'm going to do it in Python. Right? Not because I want you guys to do Python. I just want to show, you know, I, I can do this in MATLAB. Uh, and I've done some live coding in MATLAB in class. But uh, I just want to show you, expose you to something different, particularly because I think Python is a great language. It can do everything MATLAB can do. And it's free. So when you go get a job working at some independent company, and they don't want us pitch for the $10,000 MATLAB license, you still have an option. You can go, he said, Professor Foster said Mat Python can do everything MATLAB can do, and it's free. So you can still go download it and, and do your coding. Okay. Uh, and I'll try to make, some, make the case of why I think it's a, it's a good language in doing this. Uh, and also, uh, probably more important than that, it's not really about the language. It's the reason I want to do this. The, you know, when I live code these examples, just like I've done in class before, I, I talk through the logic of coding, right? I don't just, I'm not, you're just not watching me talk, talk, right, about the code. I'm, I'm talking through why I'm taking the steps, right? And so the syntax is actually not all that important. You'll see that Python has a very easy to read, nice syntax. Um, but, but the syntax is, is really not what's important. It's the logic. Because if you understand the logic, then you can just Google the syntax and you can program in any language essentially, uh, especially when you understand some things about, like, say, object-oriented programming, which Python is. Um, the other thing I want to, uh, you know, also in, in doing this, I try to talk to you about some coding best practices so I don't just turn you loose to the wolves on your project here. Um, you know, I, the, the, the way I've coded this one, um, the, this homework, if you follow these sort of rules of thumb or the coding best practices that I've done here, it'll greatly help you when you go to work your project, okay? So the project I'm going to assign before Wednesday, and then on Wednesday we'll finish this and we'll, and we'll talk about the project, okay? And it'll be due like t two weeks after, okay? So, uh, okay. So I, I'll get started. One, one of the reasons I like Python is because Python is a general purpose programming language. And what I mean by that is that, you know, as compared to MATLAB, which is essentially for scientists and engineers, okay? Python has libraries that allow you to do all the same things that you'd want to do in a numerical programming language. But it's general purpose. And what I mean by that is that, you know, there are system administrators uh, that do, you know, web hosting that regularly write code. Uh, in Python to do system admin tasks on their web servers, right? None of them use MATLAB for that, okay? And the reason that's a benefit is that there's far more users, right, as a code as a whole. There's, there's, an, there's, there's I mean, even as many scientists and engineers use MATLAB, it, it's probably 1% of all the people in the world that actually use Python. And what that means is there's lots and lots of third-party libraries of really mature packages that are really written for other fields or other tasks, but we can use them. Right? And one of those things, um, it, it seems like a small thing, but it's, it's an, a really nice uh, text parser. So what I have over here, like you guys probably on your MATLAB script, you started at the top and you had, you know, reservoir length equals something, and reservoir height equals something, right? And then you just run your script, okay? And that's fine. I mean, it's more or less what I told you to do. But I like to keep my inputs completely out of my source code. Because, you know, if I have a source code that I've tested and I've ran it, I don't want to open that source code to make changes to the inputs of the file because that's just running the danger that my cursor ends up on line 72 and I accidentally hit delete and then, then I try to run the code and, then, you know, and then I got a bug in my code for, for just because I opened it and accidentally made a typo, right? So in this way, uh, you know, my code, once I know it works, then I'm going to make all my changes over here in a text file. And so this is my input, and this is in a, in a markup format called YAML. Anybody know what YAML means? Anybody know what a markup language is? HTML is a very famous one, right? That's the language 
the web pages are made out of at least static ones, right? So HTML is hypertext markup language, that's what it stands for. YAML it stands for yet another markup language. <laughs> so uh, there are other ones, XML, you know, extended markup language, a number of them. The thing I like about YAML is it's it's very so this this is a markup language is just text with structure, right? And HTML has all this crazy open, uh, you know, open uh, uh, greater than sign, and then you type your keywords and things, and then slash less than sign. So there's all this structure in it. Um, here it's not so bad, right? There's structure to this, but it looks pretty clean. It's very human readable, right? So I sort of group my things. So I have my reservoir properties, and under that, you know, I have permeability, porosity, length, height, width of the reservoir, and initial pressure. I have my fluid properties, I have my numerical properties associated with solving the, you know, I want to use an implicit method on four grids, time step is one day, final time is 200 days, right, things like that. I have an ability to put in wells by either rate or bottom hole pressure, I indicate their, their locations and their values and their radiuses, and then I can put in other boundary conditions like Norman and Dirichlet, and then I have this unit conversion factor. So that's all my inputs. It's in a text file that's separate from my source code. And the cool thing about Python is somebody who probably wasn't an engineer, almost definitely wasn't an engineer, wrote a really nice parking, parsing library for me to use this. So whenever I want to read in my input file, I just simply, and just follow my highlighted there, I mean, this reads in my input file. This, this one line understands how to read all that in, in one line. And so all that comes in, and it's stored in input data. Okay. So all of my input data comes in and is stored in a, in, a, in a, you can think of this like a variable, right? But it's, it stores all of that in a structure, okay? Now, there's one sort of downside to, I, I actually wrote some object-oriented code here, and I'll, you'll get to see what that means in a second. But the one sort of clunky thing about Python is when you write object-oriented code, anything that's associated with the object, and an object is just means that an object can be anything and an object is something that has data, and it has functions that operate on that data. And that will allow me in a minute when I go to write functions, I don't need to, because the functions operate on the data that's contained in the object, I don't need to pass in all of these crazy things through an argument list. Like when you guys probably wrote your compute transmissibility function, you had, you know, grid block I, grid block J, and then all of the data that you need, right? So you had to pass in through the argument list permeability, porosity, you know, everything, right? Delta X, to pass all that in through the, through the argument list, right? I don't have to do that because I, I'm going to define an object that's going to contain all the data, and my compute transmissibility function operates on that object and its data, so it knows the data exists, and you'll see that mine will only have two arguments, I and J, or, you know, I and I plus one, whatever. Okay, so back to this sort of library thing uh, in this YAML parser. So I read everything in, and then the cool thing about it is I can access the data that I need in a very human-readable, straightforward way. Again, sort of forget about the selfs, but, uh, you know, when I want something like, um, you know, let's see, where's it? Well, probably here's the best. I have some checking here, but, like, these, these are very simple, right? So remember I said everything is stored in input data. But then I can just access it just like it reads over there. So if I go input data under the reservoir sort of super, uh, super category there, then height, I can store that in a variable reservoir height. Same for width, rev, length, there. Well, it, uh, this is a, an attribute, yeah, of, like in C++, right? Yeah. Where, yeah. This would be an attribute of, of the object or the class, right? This is, I created my own class up there, class homework four. So this is an attribute, yeah. So basically, but, you know, f that's really not that important. What, just understand that in this one line, I read all that in, and then I can access everything that's over there in a very human-readable way and store it in variables associated with the object. So reservoir height, reservoir width, reservoir length. And all of these will be available to me later in functions that I write without having to pass all that stuff into an argument list. Okay, so most of all of this at the beginning is just setup, right? And it seems like a lot of code, but I wrote this to be very almost production quality in the sense that 
You know, if you look over here on the right, you see I have some, like I have permeability and porosity and, I, and I've hand coded in the four grid blocks. And then below that I have it commented out where they're constants and then below that I have it commented out where they're text files. I wrote it in such a way that the code is smart enough that I don't need to give it any additional information. If I were to just comment out the first two lines and uncomment the second two, I'd have a constant perme permeability. Of, and then if I were to comment those out and uncomment the second two, it would automatically just read in from those text files. Right? So all of the first part of my code is just parsing this data and getting it into my code so that I can use it. And, and again, it's far probably overkill for than what you'd need, really kind of the minimum do. And I have some checks there, uh, you know, check input and return data. And that's essentially what it's doing is it, it goes and it finds, you know, is it a text file? Is it, is it hand typed in the input deck or whatever? Okay. So then I have a function that assigns the DX array. Again, this just says, okay, you know, how many grid blocks do I have? What's the length of the reservoir? Split it up, right? Um, if, if, the, if the file was a text file, you can't have more grid blocks than what you had initial data for. So it basically counts the number of data in that file and splits your, your length of the reservoir into that many equal things. So there's just some logic in there. But ultimately, it just returns a, this thing that's a DX array. DX array is just literally an array of the dx's. Right? So dx0, dx1, dx2, dx3, dx4, dx5. Right? Well, these, this is one dimensional. These are, these are my grid blocks. OK, so let's get to the sort of part where we're going to write some new code. I've got this function here. Compute well index locations. Okay, so this is something y'all had to do, right? Because I gave you the sort of geometric, the x locations of the of the grids. They're like five and fourteen ninety five or something. I'm sorry. I gave you the, the x location, the x coordinate in the reservoir or where the wells are, but I didn't tell you what grid block they go in. And in fact, they're going to be, you know, if it's the four grid block problem, they're in the first and the last. But if it's in the 115 grid block problem, you have to figure it out. To figure out which one they go in, okay. So this, we're going to write a little code to get started here. That's going to do that, okay. So um, the first thing I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the grid centers, right? So I'm just going to compute the, the center of these guys, okay. So and I mean, there's, there's no one way to do this. There, there's multiple ways you could do this, but this is the way I chose to do it. So uh, I'm going to compute the grid centers and what I'm going to do is use this cumulative sum okay so real quick remember I, so I have a function here that's going to operate on my object or my data and so you notice that I don't need to pass it. So I'm going to use this DX array I, crea I created in the function above it. And you notice I don't have to. It's, a, it's an attribute of my object. So I don't have to like pass it in through the argument list. Right? I don't have to send in the DX array. It's, it's just already there. It knows it's, it knows it's part of it. Okay? <laughs> and so and then just, just to be clear about, uh, again, Python versus some other language you might use. This. You know, I said that these selfs are kind of clunky, and I don't like them. I don't want to type them in my equations everywhere. So I just create a little shorter variable that points to this. Okay, and I say right here, reassignment is for convenience. This is not a deep copy. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm not making a complete copy of this array because this array could have 50 million elements. And the last thing I want to do is inside my function. T take one array and make a copy of it that has 50 million elements, especially if I'm not modifying any of it. Right? And I'm just using it. And so what this does, this assignment in Python, uh, the way I'm using it is just a pointer. So this is, this is not a deep copy of that whole thing. It's just a pointer to that thing, which is a little shorthand notation. Okay. So then I use this cumulative sum feature. And cumulative sum just literally takes the cumulative sum of that DX array. So in a, if these were all 
if all of these dx is equal to 1, let's say we have a constant root log sign, then the cumulative the sum is 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Because it's 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 4. Right? Okay, so that's my cumulative sum. That gives me, if, if, if x direction is this way, that gives me these locations, right? So, so that location is 1, that's 2, that's 3. x equals 1, 2, 3, right? So that's what I'm doing there. And then, but I want the centers. I want this point, OK? So what I do is, and I, since I want this point, then I just back up. This is delta x over 2 or dx1 over 2. Right, so I just back up that distance. And that's what the, that's what this, right. So this gives me an array that looks like that, 1, 2, 3, 4. Not necessarily 1, 2, 3, 4. That was, that's my example where dx is equal to 1. But dx could be equal to 0 0.5, 0 0.25. It just depends on the number of grid blocks you have, right. So that gives me, that returns an array, and then I just shift the array by delta x over 2, and that gives me the grid block, the centers of the grid blocks, okay? So that's just one way you can do it. The benefit is, if you do it this way, this cumulative sum is a, is a function that belongs to this so-called NumPy library, which is a Python library, which gives you sort of all of the data structures that you'd have in MATLAB. It gives you your array data structure. So you, when you say an array x times an array y, gives you element-wise multiplication of those two arrays. Right? And the, the reason that you use that whenever you can in a numerical computation is because that, f that function right there is actually run not in the Python interpreter, but in a, in a compiled C code library. And so it's really fast. It's as fast as it can be. Right? So this cumulative sum over dx is essentially, without parallelization, it's as fast as possible. Okay, so that that's on you know on that given computer. So that that's why I use that. Okay, so that now that I have the grid centers, um, I'm gonna do I'm gonna read in. I'm gonna read in the uh, coordinate locations of the wells. And, and I'm gonna do that. Okay, so when I, this is just this is actually just reading in this, right? So I have wells, and then I have a type, and then I have a location. So the well, the well type there is a variable that comes from the argument list, and the default value is rate. But I could also put bottom hole pressure if I wanted, right? So if I was looking, I'm trying to compute the well index locations. If I was looking for bottom hole pressure wells to determine their indices, then that's what I would do. I'd put, you know, I'd give this an argument, and I would say bottom hole pressure. But for right now, I'm just looking in there, wells, well type, locations. And so that comes from here. So it looks wells, rate, locations, and it reads in 5 and 14.95. Okay? So that's my x values for my well locations. So then I want to find out in what grid block those fall in. Right? That's what I'm trying to do here. So the way I'm going to do that. Um, so I'm going to write a little statement that returns true for grids that have a well. I'm just going to call this a bool array, so a boolean array.
right. So the syntax is not that important here, really. I'm just using a fancy feature that, that basically says, okay, take my grid centers and subtract dx over two. That takes me to there for everyone. And if that's less than the well locations, return true. Then do the same thing. If, if this is greater than the well locations, return true. And then compare the two, and so if they're all, if both of them are true, that means there's a well in that location, right? So in other words, what I'm saying is, if five is, you know, you're basically you're saying you're asking the question in a, in a vectorized way. The first well is in location five, so I start here and I say, okay, is five greater than that? Yes, it is. I move to there. Is five greater than that? Yes, it is. Is five greater than that? No, it's not. 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 Okay. So that's like true, true, false, 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 false. Right. Then I ask the question. I move to here, and I say, is five? Because I moved. Uh, that should be the second one. Should be plus dx. Sorry. So I say I move to here, and I say is five less than that? No, it's not. Is five or you know, less it? Then I say is five less than that? Yes, it is. So it's true. And then false, 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 false. Well, so whenever they're, whenever they're both true, there'll be a well there. Okay. So that that's just my logic to my sort of quick quick way to do it. Again, these are vectorized operations that get done. These comparisons get done in C, and they return a, a, just a bool array. So that array is just going to have true or false. True where there's wells, false where there isn't. Okay. And so then I, what I want my function to return then So you see this faint line here? That's just something I personally set up in my editor so that it try to, I don't have a hard and fast rule, but I try to not let my code lines go beyond that. Because then you can see it, when you can see all the code when you open it up, right? If you just write your code out to the 700th column, right? When you open it up, it's gonna be off the screen, you're not gonna see anything. So I, this is the 80th column. Uh, that stems from in the old days, Fortran wouldn't let you go past the 80th column. So you had to write your code in, in there. And uh, so I put this little faint line there that helps me to try to keep my code over there. Of course, you know, if it just barely goes over, I, I don't, I'm not going to move my whole thing over just to keep you know one character off the line. But anyway, so that's why that's just why I moved it over. Okay, so again, now. Uh, Basically, grid numbers are my grid numbers. Okay, so grid numbers are my grid numbers that go from in Python zero to whatever to to n, right? n minus one. And so then I'm just basically looking for when whenever this bool array is true, return the grid number, right? And then that I mean that, so that's essentially what that code does. Whenever the bool array is true, return the grid number, and then I know there's a well in that in that grid, right? So your code may look very different, and there's probably, I could come up with five different ways to do this in Python. But the idea is we're just, you had to come up with a way to take those x coordinate locations and return grid numbers, right? Because the grid numbers is what correspond to the rows in the matrix and the, and the rows in the vector, okay? So now onto something that you might care a little more, more about. So now I'm gonna compute I'm going to write my compute transmissibility function. And this is what I was saying earlier. You probably had long argument lists, right? So you probably had i and j, but you also had all of these things. dx, permeability, area, viscosity, correction factor, bw, right? All passed into your argument list. Which later you have to call that function in a loop. So maybe there's a long, ugly line in the middle of your loop, right? With all these arguments, right? It's hard to read the code. Okay, so and it, surprisingly, 
readability is very important in code because you know that ha that's how you write sustainable code and code that you can work collaborate on teams with. It's, it's almost always better to have a co piece of code that's re more readable uh, than it is fast. So a lot of times you can you can do things to speed up your code, but it make they make it look very cryptic. That's almost always a bad idea. You almost always want to prefer readability to speed in the long run, especially if you don't actually profile your code, when, especially when you're writing your code the first time. You should never like pre-anticipate, unless you really know what you're doing, you should never pre-anticipate where your code is going to be slow and, and try to do things at the beginning, at the, at, especially at the expense of making it less readable. When you write your code the first time, make it readable first and make it work <laughs> second, I guess. Those sort of go hand in hand, right? Make it do what it's supposed to do and make it readable. And then after everything is written and it works, profile your code with a proper profile and then let the profile tell you exactly where it's slow. And then work on making that part faster because what you'll find is it's almost, it's almost impossible unless you really know what you're doing to anticipate where your code is going to be slow. It's, it's uh, many times it's not where you think it is. And so make your code readable and make it work first. Worry about making it fast later. Because the, 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 the proper way to write code is you, you write your code, you, you make it work, and you write a test that checks that it works. And then you never let that test fail ever again. right? You know the code works because you checked it against some hand calculation, it, you checked it against something, and you wrote a test for that. Then you can go on making your code faster, but it still has to pass that test because that test is the gold standard that says your code is doing what it's supposed to do. Right? Okay, so here's the compute. Here's my compute tr transmissibility function. I only have two arguments, i and j, but you can think of j as like i plus one. Right? But it turns out that this function will work also equally well when we write my 2D code. I won't have to change a, th a thing in this function. Okay. So uh, the first line then I'm going to write is this uh, compute the half permeability, and this equation is straight out of the book, right? I mean, straight out of the notes. I'm going to compute the half grid distance. So then this function is going to return k half times area divided by viscosity times VW. I have this I have this snippet manager that pops up like suggestions for me. I have no idea what beerware is, but I'm really curious. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to find out what that is. So uh, let's see. It's a, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a snippet for a, for a open source license, licensed under the beerware license. <laughs> John Foster wrote this file. As long as you retain this notice, you can do whatever you want with this stuff. If we meet someday and you think this stuff is worth it, you can buy me a beer or coffee in return. <laughs> Turns out, uh, if you go to my GitHub page, there's lots of beerware license stuff there. Uh, um, okay, let's let's get rid of that. Okay, <laughs> I was curious what that was. I, I kept seeing it pop up as I was typing. I, I did not write that. That that, that was like a prepackaged. Uh, I, I do have many snippets that I wrote. That is not one of them. I showed you guys what a snippet was the other day, right? It's like a fast way to write, you know, complete code. Okay. Okay, so 
Uh, there's my compute transmissibility function. Likewise, I have one for compute accumulation. And it re again, you know, this, the, the, this equation for accumulation is not that long, right? You could put this in line in your code in the for loop if you want, right? But if you do that, I mean, the reason that, again, a good, good coding practice here is write lots of small functions, okay? Because these small functions are easy to test. You can test this by hand with your calculator, right? You can ensure that it's doing the right thing. And once you know this little tiny function is doing the right thing, you never have to look at it again ever. Because you know that that test, you know, and if you're really good, you write a test so that it's automated, right? And you, and you never have to look at it again. You know that this function is doing what it's supposed to. So when your code is not giving you the result you anticipate, you can eliminate the source of the bug is this function because you tested it individually. Same goes for that one, right? You can test it individually. You can come up with a two-block system that you can solve by hand, and you can tell in, 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 you know, in a, five minutes on a calculator, you know if that function is producing the right result. And you never have to look at that function again, and you go on, right? So this is something that you really should get in the practice of doing. Of course, in MATLAB, that means you have to have lots of function files. You can't put the functions in line in one file like this, right? You have to have a function file for every file, and that's sort of annoying, but it's still a good idea in terms of coding practice. No, no, it's just going to return it, right? Because what what I'm later later what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this function in the loop, right? And I'm going to then I'm going to store it into the B matrix, right? Because this is going to be the entries of the diagonals of the B matrix. Okay. And that's really what we're ready to do. So uh, assemble matrix. Uh, my assemble matrix um, routine here is essentially going to do that. I'm going to assemble the T, B, and Q matrices or vectors, right? So in this, to assemble T, I've got to compute all the interblock transmissibilities to assemble B. I have to compute the accumulation terms for each um, for each grid block. So um, you know, what I what I have just at the beginning, right in, is just read from the input deck number of grids. Right? So where is it? Right there. Numerical number of grids. Another thing I like about YAML is you can just sort of you know it, it knows how to handle spaces and everything, so you can just sort of write English. You know you don't have to come up with funny variable names or anything. You just write English and you can read English. Um, okay, so number of grids is n, so my T matrix is going to be n by n. Okay. Now, despite what I said about earlier about premature optimization, turns out I'm, I'm smart enough that I can do this. Okay. <laughs> in, in, terms, in terms of, uh, I'm not saying I'm smart enough. I'm, I'm, I'm a good enough coder. I've done enough of this. I'm going to do a little bit of pre, premature optimization here because I know uh, I know that this will make the code much faster in the end, okay? So remember, T is very sparse. It's mostly zeros, right? And the bigger it is, the more grids you have, the more zeros that are there. And so we don't want to store all those zeros, okay? So we're going to use a data structure that where we don't have to store those zeros, okay? And that data structure is going to be called a LIL matrix, a linked list matrix. And it's going to be in by in, and I just like to be very explicit about the data type to say that uh, it's a double, okay? And then the B matrix is going to be just zeros, just like the MATLAB zeros function, in data type double, so these are going to be floating point oper uh, you know, not, not integers. Uh, well, so I'm only going to store B as a vector for now. Right, for now. But it turns out that if I were to use that linked list, it would be the same as a as a vector. I mean, it would it would be uh, well. I'll, I'll I'll turn it into a, a sparse matrix later. Okay. Just for now, I'm gonna as I'm co computing on the fly, I'm just gonna c compute what's on the diagonal because everything else is zero, right? Okay. So. Don't worry that you don't know what this LIL matrix is, or you may. Does anyone even know what a linked list is? 
Uh, so if you take, if you were like a computer scientist, you'd take a whole course in, in data structures. And one of the things you would study for sure would be something called a linked list. So linked lists are very efficient at building data structures when you don't know exactly how much, exactly how, what's going into them, right? And so, you know, we're going to compute this matrix, so we're going to compute entries and add them on the fly, right? And so this little linked list data structure is going to, is going to build, it's going to grow. So it, it takes up a very small memory footprint at the beginning, because it's not storing any zeros. It's just, it's just storing the, the, the metadata for the overall size eventually. And then as I add real numbers to it, it's going to grow, okay? And, and you know, that's why it's sort of important to, to know a little bit about this stuff. In the end, it, it makes a big difference, right? So if you go to the documentation on this matrix, you see, you know, what are the advantages of the LIF format? Well, it supports flexible slicing. That's not really a big deal here. But right here, changes to the matrix sparsity structure are efficient. And that's what we're going to do, right? We're going to loop over the rows, and we're going to compute the non-zero entries and add them to the matrix, therefore changing the sparsity structure. The disadvantages are that arithmetic operations are slow. Like, I wouldn't want to add two LILF matrices, OK? But then you look here, and it says the intended uses. LIL is convenient format for constructing sparse matrices. Again, that's what we're going to do. In this loop over the rows, we're going to build up a sparse matrix. But once the matrix has been constructed, convert it to a compressed sparse row format for fast arithmetic and vector operations. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to build the matrix using this data structure. And then when we get ready to solve it, we're going to switch to a different format. And that's going to add a lot of speed and flexibility to the code. So you guys probably, did anyone use a sparse data structure in MATLAB? Or you just, you, you said zeros in by n. So when you use the, the issue with that is when you use the backslash operator in MATLAB with a, with a not, not sparse data structure, okay, it's going to try to do a direct inversion, a direct solve. It's going to try to invert it. And that's very inefficient when you have sparse matrices. There's a much better technique is that's to use iterative solvers. And the backslash operator in MATLAB is smart enough, actually, that it knows if you have a sparse matrix A, use an iterative solver. If you have a dense matrix A, use a direct solve. Now, you may say, well, I don't have a dense matrix. I have zeros. But the, the issue is you, you're storing them like it's a dense matrix. You stored all those zeros when you did that. Okay, So there are sparse data structures in MATLAB. And you can get more efficiency out of the linear solve, the A backslash B. You can, you can get more efficiency out of that if you use the sparse data structure. And actually, some more robustness under certain conditions as well. So. Uh, we'll stop there. I think there'll be no problem.